and what songs. Josh shared that um, God had impressed him to, um, to choose songs that they, we, the, the worship team could sing over to be a blessing to as we participate in, in our own journeys with God. But he wanted it to be something that ministered to you. And boy, did that ever. God knew what he was doing and planting that, that seed in Josh's heart. And it just dovetails so beautifully with where we're going today. Chapter 8 in John, uh, we're talking about the woman caught in adultery and brought the Pharisees brought her to Jesus. And oh my goodness, talk about being a friend of God. She just certainly discovered that. And when God's kingdom comes, what happens? Chains are broken. And uh, she stood there at the end waiting before God said, go and sin no more, and start a new life. So it, all these songs were perfect. Go ahead and open your Bibles to John 8. Hopefully you have already read the chapter in preparation. If not, um, just pay attention to grace notes and just kind of follow through. Uh, each week we're following up a different chapter and uh, studying the Word of God and seeing how we see Jesus more clearly through it. So we know chapter 8. We know chapter 8 by the story of the woman caught in adultery. This is where, you know, a little bit of racy story in the New Testament. We get lots of them in the, in the Old Testament. This is our, our token story in the New. Um, but what we have after that, do you know what the rest of chapter 8 is about? We have that great story everyone knows, and then what? Well, I discovered then what a little more closely. The rest of chapter 8 is a conglomeration of Jesus' teaching. Well, conglomeration, it could have been. He just you know, went on and had these, these discussions with the scribes and Pharisees and the, the people in the temple courts there as he taught. Um, typical in John fashion, he, there's a point of Jesus that's brought up. There's discussion, there's debate, and there Jesus teaches and, and has a point made. Um, biblical scholars kind of wade through this. They're not sure, if, did John just roll all his teachings in this particular place, all just kind of boom, boom, boom together, or was this truly what Jesus taught in, in sequence? Either way, um, why? Why the story? Why in chapter 8? Why was it laid out that we have a story of the woman caught in adultery and then the teachings of Jesus? And the teachings, when you start reading through them, they feel like they're kind of all over the place. And so when I was studying this, I, I had to pull back and say, okay, I only have, what, 30 minutes or so um, on Sabbath morning, so how do you pull this all together? And so I tried to pull back and say, what's the bigger picture? What's the theme? Why, what was Jesus trying to teach? And why did he continue going round after round with these irritating religious leaders who were out to kill him? Why did he continue engaging with them? And so I've had to stop and think, well, what's the whole Bible about? What's Jesus' purpose? Why did he come in the first place? It's to show us who God is, right? Jesus always is coming back around to, he's come to reveal the heart of God, who his love, who he is, his love for us, his purpose, his plan for us. And that's throughout scripture. The whole theme throughout the Bible is revealing the heart of God for us. And so in all that we see and hear, whenever Jesus shows up and whenever he's speaking, we must find a way that that points back to what his purpose was. And so when I started looking at that overarching direction, then I started seeing how each of these pieces that seemed so disconnected in some way, they started to kind of make sense. And his perseverance was profound. And he kept coming back around, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know who I am. You keep calling me by the wrong things. You keep associating me with the wrong concepts. You're getting the wrong view of God. I want you to know the truth. I want you to know about me because then you'll know the truth about God. And then you'll find life. And so when we look at that theme and we put it and look at it with the chapter of John, it starts to connect in a way the disparate parts start to connect. So we're going to dive in first with a story that we know so well. The woman caught in adultery, chapter 8. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to overview it. I really wish the title could be changed, um, which there's really no title. We just kind of say it like that. But I really think it should be named the God of mercy caught in action. Not the woman caught in adultery, but the God of mercy caught in mercy. The God of mercy caught in action. 
Some preliminaries. So the story is the Pharisees and scribes, they find this woman, they, they catch her in the act of adultery, and they bring her to Jesus um, to say, what shall we do with this woman? Now, if a question back then needed to be settled, it was common practice, you find a rabbi to answer it. So they, when other times they're disparaging his name, uh, here they're saying, oh, well, you're a, you're a rabbi, you're a teacher, so you answer this question. Adultery, especially back then, well, it should be any time, but especially in the Jewish culture, not taken lightly at all. They, as a matter of fact, they had a saying that you must die, you better die, before you would be found guilty of idolatry, worshiping idols, murder, or adultery. So it's better for you to die first than to get involved in any of those three. Of course, if you don't choose to follow that saying, they'll make sure you die afterwards because the punishment, especially for adultery, was death. No way around it. Death was the penalty. Whether you were a man or a woman, now, if you're a man, you might have a different way to death. It doesn't necessarily have to be stoning, depending on the situation. Could be strangulation, so much better than death. But, I mean, than stoning. But the woman, the woman always was stoned. Didn't matter, it might have been here or there, in different places, in the temple, outside the temple, but she was stoned. No two ways about it. So they bring this woman caught in adultery. No wiggle room for the law of Moses. And so they set her before Jesus and they say, so tell us, Rabbi, what shall we do with her? It was clearly a trap because three options he had, uh, well, two. If he said, yes, you need to stone her, he was going to be breaking the Roman law because the Roman law stated that he was not allowed to condemn anybody to death. Doesn't matter if he was a rabbi, part of the, you know, if they're religious rulers, you are not allowed to condemn to death. You may have your opinion on it, but it would have to go to the Roman law. So if he's like, yes, absolutely, she needs to be stoned to death, well, psh, go tell on him to the Romans. If he said yes, another trap, if he said yes, she needs to be stoned, there goes his reputation as being a friend of God, as being a friend of sinners. God, Jesus, being a friend of sinners, showing love and mercy, that would be out the window if he says, yeah, go ahead and stone her, right? And number three, if he says, don't stone her, do not stone her, he would be breaking, clearly breaking the law of Moses so unabashedly, and then he would get his own due course of punishment and his own death for that. So how do you answer that? Yes or no? He kind of is in a rock, stoning, rock in a hard place. <laughs> that was Mark's. Uh, Mark always gets the good ones. Um, movie moment. What was Jesus going to do? So we see Jesus here. You know the story. He, instead of speaking, he bends and writes in the sand. He starts to write in the sand, and it says that he, he mentions, you know, those who are without sin, cast the first stone. When you look at without sin, it's even without sinful desire. So if you've not had any sinful desires, go ahead and, you know, stone her. And it says one by one, they walk away. Now, I've always thought it was creative supposition. You've heard the phrase, well, Jesus must, or, or the idea that Jesus must have been writing their sins in the sand. Must have been writing that because then, you know, they, they look and they're like, well, I don't want to do anything because he obviously knows what I've been up to. But when you actually look at the Greek words, there's some foundation to why that creative supposition is around. When you look at the word to write, so Jesus starts writing in the sand and he started to write. The Greek word to write is graphene. And that simply means to write. But the word that John chooses to use here is catagraphene. And that, the most common interpretation of that word is not just to write, not just to write words, but specifically to write down a record against. So more than supposition, there's some, some foundation to that idea that perhaps he was writing the records against those who were condemning and judging this woman. We won't know for sure until we're actually face-to-face -face and talking to him, but there's, there's some good foundation there. But the story ends. Everyone leaves. The woman is left with Jesus. He looks up. He's like, is no one condemning you? She's like, nope, no one. And so he's like, well, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. And so ends the story. 
In this story, we have a great contrast. And through the rest of the chapter, we have contrast between who God is and who man is. How God operates in life and how we tend to operate in life. The contrast, you lay it out. If this was a scene starting, the beginning starts with the players, the religious authorities, experts in law. These guys knew what the law was about, which was supposed to represent who God was about. Legal experts, experts of the law, and a woman guilty of obvious sin. They saw, not a woman, the Pharisees and scribes, the religious authorities, saw a problem an unsavory mistake that needed to be punished, as well as an opportunity to make a point, to trap this rebel Jesus, and in one swoop, clean up the wrongs and the wrong people of the world. Those problems that that cause issues and embarrassment. Their attitude, critical, condemning, moral watchdogs of everyone, unsympathetic, and unforgiving. And so that's their duty. Here we have a problem. It is our role to be a moral watchdog. We need to take care of this problem. Our duty is to make sure she realizes her grave condition, feel bad for what she's done, and punish her to the point of death. Get rid of her. That's the beginning. That's how the story starts. How the story ends is you have God God, the expert on life and love. And you have the woman still there, still guilty of obvious sin. God saw, Jesus saw, not a problem, but a person. He saw a person in a human vessel, imperfect, yes, but somehow Jesus was able to see beyond and see your hopes and dreams and see a heart that wanted to know true life. He didn't see a problem, but a promise for a life of possibilities. Here was God. In contrast to man, his attitude was one of mercy, was not judging her condition, but seeking to restore her condition, to help, and he was the initiator of freedom and forgiveness. And so his duty as God, as the expert on life and love, was to release this woman from her snares. His duty as God was to help her be free and to find true life. The contrast between man and God. Both had authority. Did they not? Both were experts in something. God, of course, had the the upper hand. He was an expert on life and love. But the experts of the law, of the legal system, And with power, you've heard this, with great power comes great responsibility. Whether you're a parent or a boss or you're the more popular kid at school or of your group or you have influence of any sort or leadership in any realm, any kind of authority, if you have any kind of influence, you have responsibility. How do you view that responsibility? What is your responsibility with the power that you've been given, however small or large it is? Well, how you view that affects how you act. When we look at the scribes and Pharisees, they clearly saw that their responsibility was to judge, was to make a judgment. They saw the responsibility as to be in a position to stand over and point out the errors and mistakes of others. And I believe they got this interpretation of this was their role from their understanding of who God was and the importance of the law to God. To them, the focus on doing right and not doing wrong, on behavior more than relationship, is what they saw as being pleasing, utmostly pleasing to God. And so they spent most of their time, when they were in the word, most of their time was to make sure they got it right, that it was behavior that counted. And so rather than looking to see how they could depend on God, go deeper in relationship with him, become like him in their heart and spirit, they sought to make sure every dot and tittle, every mark and movement was on doing what was right and avoiding what was wrong. Now it started from a good place, 
It started from good desire. They had so many times strayed from who God was. So many times they're like, yes, 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 we love you. And then they went their own way. Yes, God will follow you. And they followed their own paths. And again and again, God had to keep bringing them back. And so they decided we are never going to stray from God again. We're going to follow every single thing he tells us beyond what he tells us, every every single thing we can think of to follow, that's what we're going to do. And pretty soon that focus on making sure they were doing the right thing usurped their focus on being right in relationship with God. Jesus, on the other hand, lived out of the authority of being God. And what we see translated as we see, how did he interpret then his responsibility is how he responded to those who were struggling. And what we see that he views as his responsibility with power was to love, was to show mercy, was to set free, was to walk with, was to draw people to depend on God, to believe and trust in what he could do on their behavior, in them, through them, for them. His view of authority was to heal to help. A responsibility of someone in power was to help people sink themselves into a life that was Godward, into his word so that they might not just obey him, but know him and love him. And out of that knowing, that breathing in, that remaining in, that loving obedience to God would come as a natural outcome, as God's spirit continued to meld with theirs. Religious authorities in this particular situation who treated women, treated this woman as a problem, I doubt very much they even knew her name. I doubt very much they even cared if she had one, what her feelings were or what her life had been before this moment or what she wanted and hoped her life would be. To them, she was something to be dealt with and only beneficial for how she could benefit them and their plan to use her as a pawn to take down Jesus. Jesus, in contrast, treated her and saw her as a person, not a thing. We're not told of the whole conversation, but I have no doubt that if Jesus didn't know her name, he would have asked for it. He would have asked her, and they would have had more time to talk before a quick dismissal. I believe this because we see in the Bible that people, individuals, are important to God. We know God loves us on an individual, personal basis because we see in the Bible there's a fondness for names, and a person's name is a symbol of who they are and their value. We see in Exodus 33, God says to Moses, I know you by name. In Isaiah 45, he says to Cyrus, it is I, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. And there are whole pages we see in the ancestries of names, specific names in the Bible. We know that God calls us his sons and his daughters that he wants to adopt. And you don't have a son or a daughter without giving them a name. He calls us his beloved his treasures, his children that he longs to gather to him like a mother hen does her chicks. We are the ones that he takes delight in. This is how our God views us. Humanity to God is not just a mass of people to be dealt with. To God, individuals are not just cases to work through. And he doesn't see people as general abstractions or problems that we brush over and move on to the more important. How we see Jesus, how we see God himself in Jesus treating this woman and others like her was so far outside the realm of the religious mindset of what they should be focused on was so far out of the mindset of how sin and sinners should be treated, so far from God, they thought, that it was worth killing Jesus over. It was such a scandal to be so loving. There's a note in your Bible, either the beginning of chapter 8 or as a footnote. And what does it say in your Bible? And then that, in that prelude or footnote about chapter 8, about the beginning of chapter 8. It's not in the earlier manuscripts. So there's a question mark. Where did the story come from and why is it here? And I think as you dig into the history as to why this was included or not included, then we see how it makes sense, perhaps in light of who Jesus was, perhaps 
why it wasn't included. Most of the older manuscripts um, that were taken handwritten, the ones that were considered most reliable to give us the Bible that we have today, uh, they came together around the 4th to 6th century. The New Testament is based primarily on these older texts, the ones that were handwritten. The earliest manuscript, this story is only found in one of those early manuscripts. Six of them omit it completely, and two of them, which is interesting, two of them leave a blank space where that story normally would be found. The earliest versions of the translations of the Bible into other languages other than Greek, none of them include that story. And it's not until Greek and medieval manuscripts that you see the story then become much more prevalent. But it is in one of the older manuscripts, and it is interesting to note those blank spaces. In addition, in the early 2nd century, now the Bibles are put together, I mean, the, the, this version around 4th to 6th century, Eusebius, who is the church historian, records a story from Papias, who died around AD 100, so early 2nd century, and he tells a story of a woman who was accused of many sins and brought before the Lord. You also find in the book Apostolic Constitutions that was quoted and written in the 3rd century, this story was found in this book as well, 3rd century. This story was recorded for the purpose of warning the bishops who were being too strict. And the 4th century, Jerome included this in his Vulgate. The Vulgate was the Latin translation of the Bible that eventually in the 16th century became the Catholic Bible. This story was included here. And we have the first Greek commentator talking about this story in AD 1118. And the great Latin church fathers at this time often started speaking in this story. But what I find most interesting is in the 4th century, this is a time when the Bible was coming together from these early manuscripts. In the 4th century, we have Augustine and we have the Bishop Ambrose. Both of them often spoke of the story and wrote about it. And what we find that Augustine said, I think, gives insight that I find most profound as to why it was not included or admitted, left as blank spaces in the early writings he wrote that it was omitted in early manuscripts because some of those who were writing were of slight faith and wished to avoid scandal. Early church. Early church surrounded by pagan cultures. They wanted to have the high road to help people set themselves on a, on a higher way of living, trying to forge eternal quality kind of living. And how do you include this dangerous story and include this with people could take it and run with it. What if they saw that Jesus has this light view of adultery? That kind of mercy, that kind of grace, so scandalous that they feared including it, feared that this wild kind of love and grace associated with our God might just lead people astray into more sin, and so they admitted it altogether. Now, it's a theory. We don't know, but it makes sense when you see that the Pharisees and scribes wanted to kill Jesus over such scandalous kind of grace. And so it makes sense that it perhaps would be omitted from that. They wanted to kill him back then for it. It seems likely that it was killed in the manuscripts centuries later. The question is, what are we doing with it? How we speak and act, are we furthering this trend? of killing the scandalous love and mercy of God? Or are we finding ways like Jesus to let the ways of God, the heart of God, be seen in scandalous truth and light? What are we doing with our words? What are we doing with our actions with those who make mistakes? This is where it gets personal. This is where the story gets personal. When someone you know close to you makes a relational mistake or wrongs you in some way, doesn't respect you, or when you see them failing to keep in line with what they know to do, that's right and good, but you keep seeing them fail. They live a life that is far from what you or they know is pure or right or good. When a person keeps sinning over and again and when they're failing and they're floundering, What's our view? How do we respond? Do we respond like the scribes and Pharisees with repulsion and criticism? 
or perhaps just quiet judgment in our own hearts and minds. Or like Jesus, is our first thought, how can we help? How can we restore? How can we release them from whatever holds them back to find freedom from the pain and to more life? As I was reading this and studying chapter 8, the story, this experience came back to me when I was just in uh, in college, and one of those summer jobs, you're babysitting kids, you really don't want to be babysitting, but you need the money. So I had these two girls I was babysitting, and they lived out in the country, and they came, and their neighborhood boys, they wanted to all go fishing down at the pond. I'm like, great, great, they had fishing poles and everything, this is perfect. So they grabbed their fishing poles, we raced down to the pond, I'm all excited, this is cool, they're all occupied. I don't have to worry about them. So they're fishing, fishing, everything's great until they catch a fish. And when they catch a fish, then all of a sudden they're screaming. And they're like, no, no, it's gross. It's wet. It's slimy. And I'm just like, get it off the hook. Take it off the hook. Throw it back in the water. Like, no, we're not going to touch it. That's gross. And none of them, they all were expert fishermen before we got to the pond. When they caught the fish, I realized none of them had ever caught a fish before and none of them wanted to touch it. Now for me, I apologize to you fishermen who like to catch and eat the fish, but I like to set them free. And so I'm like, take it off the hook. Finally, when I realized they would not, I had to get up close and personal with this fish. I had to be the one, because I didn't want the hook tearing the fish's mouth. I had to hold the slimy, yucky, wiggling fish. I had to help remove the hook and put it back in the water so we could have freedom and life again. And thinking about the story, I thought, what if we took on the role of benevolent fishermen in our view of those who do wrong to us, to others? And if you are not a benevolent fisherman, think about a child that gets caught in a thorny bush or, or accidentally steps in or sits in a pile of ants. Our first response isn't, stupid child, getting caught, sitting in the wrong place? What are you thinking? They shouldn't have wandered there. They should have kept their eyes open. They should have studied the terrain a little better than they did. They should have gotten better information. They should have cared about their choices and consequences. That's not our response, is it? Our response is immediately, how can we help alleviate the painful situation? It's how do we get them to a better place, no matter how wise or unwise their choices have been. This isn't where anyone wants to be in their life. Part of pain, causing pain, or furthering pain. So how can we respond in a way that helps restore and release pain and moves us back to life? I think the sooner that we can get to mercy, and love rather than blame or judgment, the more in the Spirit of God we'll be dwelling, and the deeper we'll be able to go into living in the very center of His will for us here on earth, and the freer we will all be. I believe it's up to God. Completely, according to Scripture, the Spirit's the one that convicts someone of their wrongs. It's the Spirit's role to convict of sin, of someone who is missing the marks in life so that they God can get them back onto the path of life. Our role is not God's role. Nor is our role to be a moral watchdog over others for God. Nor is our role to judge or condemn or make sure they pay the price. Our role, with the power that's been given us through Jesus Christ, with his spirit in us, is to love. Is to help them move from death to life by loving, serving, and finding ways to bless them. As a parent, as a boss, any position we have of authority, any position where we are in relationship with another, there will be a need for us to exercise power. How are we operating from power of judgment or from the power of love? Is it making people feel worse about themselves or helping them find hope and see promise that life is possible? and be that bridge to the life giver who is God. Of course, it's easier said than done. That's why we have story after story in the Bible. It's easier said than done. I think that's what Jesus recognized. I think this is what Jesus recognized. Man is clearly not God. 
and so far from operating like him. And if we ever want to be able to more fully embrace God's ways, I think Jesus got this, we have to have a correct view of who God is. John 15 through 17, those, those old chapters before Jesus leaves his disciples, he's giving them some really heart-to-heart -heart talks. And in those chapters, he says in many different ways, to know God is to love him. And to love him is to want to remain in him, sink yourself into him, and to obey him, and to love like him. But it all starts with knowing who God is. And I believe this is why Jesus came and lived his life and taught over and over so we could know the heart of God, so we could love like the heart of God. Amen. And what we see of the remaining chapter looking at this view, and you can go through, I'm going to be referencing, you have, again, many different sections, but there's that overall intent showing that man is clearly not God, and Jesus shows us that if you want to love and know me, you need to stick with me, and then you will know truth and have freedom. Verses 23, I'm just going to kind of clip through some of these. Verses 23 and 24, he lays it out very black and white for the Jewish rulers there. He says, you're from below, I'm from above. You got it? Okay, no. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. Does that help? So he goes and he continues. All right, he says, well, if you don't believe, here's how it's going to roll out. If you don't believe and trust who I am, I'm telling you, you're going to die in your sin. Now, the actual word for sin here is missing the mark, missing the target. You think, well, what's the aim? What's the target of life? What's the, what's the, miss, what's, what's, what's the target of life? What's the aim of life? To live. It's pretty simple. <laughs> it's a trick question, kind of. But to, to live fully, to live fully. When you don't know God or Jesus, you're going to miss out on how to live fully. You're going to miss out on what's important. And so he's telling these rulers, you miss the target. And he goes on further. You not only just miss the target sinning, you're not even looking on the right map where the target is. It's like you've made your own map, this legalism, this whole system of focusing on what's right and wrong. This whole system is a completely different map. And when you make the conclusion that that's who God is and that's what life's about, you're going to miss the mark because the mark isn't even on that map. Do you see? So Jesus says, eternal life, right kind of living starts with me, trusting me, sinking yourself into my word. He, he talks about this when he talks about uh, verse 31, if you hold my teachings, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Be a disciple, a lifetime learner. That's what a disciple is, a lifetime learner who seeks after the heart and mind of God. This is where you'll find life. This is where you'll hit, not miss, hit the target. But he says, if you're not even on the right map, you're going to miss it. And whatever isn't life is death. So if you want life, you got to know me. But throughout the rest of the chapter, throughout different verses in the chapter, verse 14, 19, 28, 54, Jesus repeatedly tells them, but I'm telling you, you don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know God, the one who sent me. You have no idea. You don't know me. And in verse 25, they confirm this by saying, who are you? Who are you? After the incident of the woman, after the incident of the woman, Jesus lays out in the following verses who he is. And again, he contrasts this with who man is. He starts off in this, in this whole experience looking at the way that, that he handled, Jesus handled the sinner, justice versus his way of mercy. And he goes from there and he shows who these religious rulers have become by creating and looking at the wrong map, the wrong target. And when they're versions of the law, when they think that's what pleases God, he warns them, if you don't get on the right path, you're going to experience death. And so this contrast in verses, you have him contrasting in verse 15, man rulers, you judge by human standards. Verse, verse um, 15, he says, I don't judge. If I had a cause to make a judgment call, you can know it would be right because God is in me and he is love. And so my judgments, I know everything about you and that can cause fear, but it should not cause fear because I am all about love and mercy 
And so I can judge, and that will lead you to understanding mercy in my heart. Verse 23 to 24, he says, you miss the mark, that sin. You keep missing seeing your focus is not on me, and you're following your own ways. And when he gets down, he says, but I am the light of the world. I can show you the right way to go. The light of the world, that was another way of saying I'm the Messiah, because the Jews called the Messiah. That word to them was light. Verse 34, 37, he says, you're slaves to your own focus. You're slaves in your sin. You're slaves to your legalism. You're murderers. You're so full of yourself, you have no room for the word of God. In contrast, he says, I'm the one that offers you freedom from slavery. I offer you truth in verse 32. You see him calling in verse 44. You know who your dad is? It's the devil. Darkness. Evil. That's who your dad is. And D says, you know who I am? I'm the son of man. I'm the Messiah who saves you from the devil, who saves you from darkness, who saves you from evil. I am the son of man. And finally, verse 39 through 41, he talks about how they're self-deceived. They keep saying that they're children. We're children of Abraham. Don't tell us what we are. We're children of Abraham. But he says, you don't do what Abraham did. You don't have the heart or the look or the feel or the genes of Abraham. If you did, you would have the faith in me. You would believe in me. You would trust in me, in God, like Abraham did. And in contrast, Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. And he lays out profoundly there, I am, not I was, but I am present. I am eternal. I am timeless because I am God. Jesus said in verse 15, he didn't come to judge. A lot of those phrases sounds pretty judgy to me. You're missing the mark. You're slaves to your own focus. You're lost in your sin. You're murderers. You're liars. Your dad is the dark, evil devil. You're self-deceived. You're full of yourself. Doesn't that sound kind of judgmental? But if Jesus says he does not come to judge, then why these statements? And I think if, again, we remember who Jesus is, rather than being condemning of the scribes and Pharisees, as Jesus is the light of the world, I think this is more of Jesus holding up a mirror to the scribes and Pharisees so they can see themselves fully and clearly. And he says, something's not lining up in your life. Something's not lining up in your heart, and in your actions. You say that you know God. You say that you love God. You say that you're children of God. But take a look, because your actions here, totally different picture. You're like missing the mark completely. And if you don't wake up, this is Jesus' call. If you don't wake up, the path you're on, the how-to map of life that you're following that has the wrong targets all over it, it's going to lead to death. You will die in your sin. You will die from missing the mark. And so he says, well, if you're not filling up on me, I can tell you death is already happening. There's death of mercy. We saw that clearly with how you treated the woman. There's already death happening. There's death of compassion When you're not filling up with me, death happens. There is death of truth. When you're not filling up with me, death happens. There's death of spirit. There's death of mind. There's death of soul. There's death of humility. There is death of love. And I think it's like Jesus. He moves from interaction with them and the woman looking at how they treated this woman to what they're doing in the rest of their life. And he's saying, before it's too late, believe in me. Trust in me, turn back to me, and then you will know truth. The truth of who I am and the truth will set you free, set you free to life. And when the Son has set you free, it says in chapter 8, you will be free indeed. John 10, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, we'll read that Jesus calls himself our shepherd, and as our shepherd, he calls his sheep us by name. He knows the path that you and I are on. He knows our struggles. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows the ugly of it. 
He knows if where we are is on target or missing the mark or completely on a wrong map altogether. He knows, and I think he unsettles us inside. He nudges us, he stirs us to know it too if we're not where we need to be to have life in him. And he holds up that mirror as well, not to judge us, not to condemn us, but that stirring or unsettling with something that's not going quite right in your life, that unsettling is to offer us a different direction, a different map that has a mark on it to aim for, highlighted in bold, and the name of the destination is Jesus Christ. He has that clearly marked out because by no other name, by no other name, we knew no other name than Jesus, we would already be home. If we knew no other name but Jesus, we would have eternal joy and peace and hope. And so when we seek out that name, that direction, that mark in our life, we will find life and the truth that we need and the freedom from whatever is holding us back from living that eternal quality kind of life right now. Jesus says he's our light, the light of the world. He says that he will always be the eternal I am. And so truth and freedom and a savior in our life will always be present for us in whatever our situation. He knows our name, he calls us by name, and he longs for us to call on his. Let's pray. God, so many times in our life, in our situations, it feels like we stand like the woman brought before you. And there are those voices inside our head or those voices outside of us that are accusing, that are judging, that are condemning, that are critical, that are telling us, get on the right path, you loser. And we have all that going through our head and we know we're not where we're supposed to be so many times. And yet you give us this hope, this picture of you in scripture that says you stand there too because you are the I am and you are with us, and you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so you stand there too. And just like that woman, she saw the accusers leave, and what was remaining was you, and she waited. She didn't run away. She didn't hide. She didn't quickly leave before you would condemn her. She waited to see what the verdict would be. And so many times, God, that's where we are. We so badly want to have life, and we don't always make the right choices. And so in those times, God, remind us to turn to you and to hear your words of mercy and love, your hand reaching out to restore us and to set us on the new map, a new path that leads us to true life. You're the one that puts your spirit in us so that we have the power to follow you. We have the desire to follow you. And so when we don't, when we're not even sure we have that, just grab us by the hand and pull us to you, God, because that's where we want to be. Thank you for the worship we had this morning where we we were reminded that we are called your friend, not servants, but friends, where you tell us that you have freedom that will break every chain that will set us to a new life. And all we have to do is wait on you, not run, not hide, but stand there and wait for you to do and to show and to be our Savior. Thank you so much, God. We thank you so much. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.